whether you want me to welcome speak. to our first executive speaker for the fall 2022 uh semester <laughs> we're very excited that you're all here this evening um in a moment i'm going to call up our dean of the school of business dr Kimberly Hollister, who will be introducing our featured speaker for this evening. But at this moment, what I'd like to do is talk for a, about the logistics. Our session will run, the presentation will have a, what we'll call our fireside chat, which will run until about 6.45, at which point, um, if there are any undergraduate students who do need to make a seven o'clock class, we'll give you an opportunity to politely uh, exit the room so you're not late for your class. But we do ask for our MBA students and anyone else in the audience who is not rushed to get to a class to please feel free to hang around. And we'll do probably a 15 minute Q&A following that um, exit point. So please wait. You'll see me come up here about 645 after I say a few words at that point. That's when we'll have the people who need to make it to their seven o'clock class have a polite exit. So at this point, let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Kimberly Hollister. Good evening, everyone. It is great to be here. Um, so while our guests get settled for the chat, I just want to give you a little bit of information about, um, about who you're going to be hearing from tonight. So our featured speaker is Nadine Leslie. She currently serves on the board for the university's foundation. Um, she spent her most of her career um, in industry, over 25 years of experience doing um, strategic management, compliance, um, client relations. Um, her last role was she was chief executive officer of Suez North America from 2019 to 2022. And just to put it in perspective, um, she was responsible for overseeing one of North America's leading environmental companies with revenues exceeding over $1.1 billion. Um, providing water recycling and recovery services to over 6.6 .6 million people across the United States and Canada. So just a little bit of a responsibility that she had while she was there. Um, she also currently is um, doing strategic consulting for a number of organizations and serves on a number of boards, uh, including Hackensack Meridian Health Network, um, I said our foundation board, um, Provident Financial Services and Provident Bank, and Seven Seas Water Group. So we've set up tonight to be a fireside chat, and we are also fortunate that we have um, Rich Henning here with us tonight, who's going to serve as the uh, part of the, the Q&A, and he's currently Senior Vice President um, of Communication and External Affairs for um, Veolia North America. Um, and so he oversees all of the internal and external communication programs for the company's corporate offices um, and all of their operations. So he's also had a long and story career. He could too be our executive speaker um, with management positions with General Electric, General Electric, RCA, Panasonic. Um, and he's also serves on a number of boards on the Pascack Valley Medical Center. And he's on the board of directors for the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation. So with further ado or no further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Rich. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Wow, this is a, a fantastic turnout for a Monday night MBA class. I, I really uh, feel uh, just enamored that uh, everybody's been out here to, to make us feel so warm and, and welcome. So thank you all for, for making it. Uh, today I get to basically host a conversation with somebody I've known and respected for 20, 22 years uh, of my life and 22 years of her life as well. It's, it's gone to tell you the truth like that as, as life seems to always go. You spend your first 18 years wishing you were older and then afterwards you wish you were younger. So, you know, I'd love to, we've sat in your seats before. These are good seats too, don't worry about it. It's not that bad. So we're gonna start off a little bit talking about Nadine's career and the milestones that were so important and vital to her success. And the reason we talk about the milestones is because each time that you are faced with a decision you're going to make in your career, and you've already faced a number of them, what college do I go to? You know, what do I have for breakfast? The important questions in life. 
those are the questions that are going to basically define your career. But what we'll do with, with, with Nadine here today is kind of talk about the milestones that were important to her success. What were the things and the opportunities and the risks that, uh, you know, that she's taken uh, in, in, in her uh, career? And since I've had the privilege of uh, working with her for 22 years, there's a lot of interaction here about a lot of the things that we worked on together. Um, the, the way I'd love to start this though, is by you know, talking about advice and career advice. And you know, both of us were very fortunate in having really good parents, parents that really helped us kind of navigate those fields and a nurturing hand in our, our own development. Um, but I'm gonna think Nadine, from your perspective, who were the mentors in your life and what did they mean to you? Well, first, hello everyone. I'm really happy and delighted to be here with you today and uh, sharing uh, my journey with you as you are embarking yours. I hope uh, that you will find some insights uh, in what I'm gonna be sharing with you and uh, because uh, it's your time now and uh, you are getting ready to make a difference in the world. So when we talk about mentors, uh, I have to go back uh, to uh, my parents, because I think uh, there are some uh, strong values that were instilled in me at a very early age. So my parents, uh, who I uh, really cherish uh, very much, uh, were the one uh, that through their actions and their words, taught me the value of really someone's word, respect of yourself and others, the importance in managing my finances and control their debts. Uh, I remember my father talking to me about that when I was 10 years old. And, uh, but uh, really strong uh, values that allowed me to understand uh, the importance of uh, education and knowledge and the hard work that is required to really acquire that knowledge. One of the things that also stayed with me is uh, the fact that they always focus on the importance of giving back. So it's something that I will probably touch a lot with you uh, tonight because it's an important part of your journey. Someone help you to get where you are today and you have the obligation to give that hand to someone else. So my mother, she really, for me, exemplify what I will say, uh, strength, courage, perseverance, and grace. And uh, she's behind a lot of uh, my achievements. Uh, and at 86 today, uh, she's still an inspiration for me uh, and many others. My father was uh, the discipline figure. <laughs> and uh, he was uh, really uh, someone uh, that uh, um, instilled in me uh, the love of science. He uh, really encouraged me to be curious about the world, uh, to explore the world, and uh, to pay attention to details, to understand uh, the impact of my actions, and uh, to uh, also uh, aspire to greatness. And um, he, uh, he used to tell me, yes, you're going to work hard. And he used to challenge me a lot uh, during my early schooling years. But uh, he was there with me, um, holding my hands, encouraging me, and, and really pushing me through. And I want to talk also about my brother, because I had an older brother, just a year difference. And what I learned with him was uh, to be competitive because I always wanted to do things better than him. <laughs> and if you have siblings, you know that uh, that's something that always uh, uh, happened. But one of the lessons that I, uh, uh, I learned from him was very valuable to me. I was uh, shy when I was young and uh, I had some doubts about myself. And he really took the time because he was very... Uh, uh, an excellent uh, speaker. And he, he, he took the time to teach me that fear is uh, everywhere and it's present in pretty much everything that we do. But fear is also meant to be conquered. So every time in my life uh, that I was uh, concerned or a little bit uh, afraid to go to the next level, that sentence always come back to my mind. And uh, because often we just put limits to ourselves. 
So um, later on in life, I would say that, that uh, my, my teachers, my professors, extended family members, a lot of people really contributed to help me have a strong foundation that really was key for me and to, in terms of preparing me to face the challenges and opportunity that we'll have um, during my journey. But a significant aspect of my professional life, beside uh, what I learned in the water industry from experts, from my peers, colleagues, and others, peers like Rich, uh, my former boss that is in the audience, uh, Bob Ayakulu, what was really a significant uh, value for me was to have a mentor. And I had several of them during my journey. And uh, the importance of having uh, a mentor is, first of all, you have uh, to choose the right one, but it's someone that will have the experience and wisdom to give you constructive feedback, who have tough conversations with you, someone that you trust that you can go to, that have your back and really contribute greatly to the growth uh, of your career. So I cherish my mentors uh, very, very much. I, I, I'm still in touch with them. And uh, they are uh, really um, the people that made a difference in my career. And I'm very grateful for the time and interest that they had in helping me grow uh, through the years. In that way, we're both very fortunate to have family members who have been so critical in our lives. Um, as you've grown throughout your career, and we're going to walk, walk through some of those steps, have there been even work mentors that have sort of helped you at least, you know, blaze the trail or to move forward within, you know, what you were looking to do and, and your success within your career? Yes. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, when I go back and I look at uh, the people that influenced me, I will say that um, as uh, a young uh, graduated uh, student, I was looking uh, to find some women that would be my role models. And I was looking at women in the water industry and it was a little bit hard to find uh, at that time a, a woman in leadership position in, uh, in the environmental and water business. So, um, I remembered uh, one person that uh, my father used to use as an example for me when he was talking to me uh, about science. And it's a uh, Polish French uh, uh, chemist and a physicist. And, and her name is Marie Curie. And she was uh, in 1909, um, the first woman that was a professor at the University of Paris. But uh, more importantly, she was uh, a pioneer uh, in uh, many discoveries. So uh, for me, uh, uh, when I look at uh, the challenges that she had to overcome as a woman, when uh, women didn't have a seat in math and science, uh, I always go back and say, well, if she could have done that and overcome so many uh, challenges, uh, at the, at the time uh, that she was living, then uh, I should be able to do it because her and many other women have paved the way uh, for me to achieve really greatness. And uh, I had the obligation in the memory of their work and sacrifice to do my best and to reach my full potential. So for me, uh, those were the, uh, the stories that motivated me and, and of course, uh, uh, when I look at Rosa Parks, uh, you know, standing for what's right and to have a fair and equitable world. Um, when you like, look at more recently, uh, uh, Michelle Obama uh, or uh, Mother Teresa, you know, and, uh, and one uh, woman that I follow very closely uh, because she is also a very strong inspiration for me is uh, Christine Lagarde, which is the president of the European Central Bank. And uh, so today we can find a lot, <laughs> as, as women, we can find a lot more uh, leaders that uh, we can uh, look up to and uh, to, to be inspired and push ourselves uh, to reach our full potential. And when we talk about full potential, I mean, uh, Kimberly had graciously read off you know, our, our biographies, but 
what we don't tend to sometimes put in the biography are the glass ceiling sometimes that can halt somebody's career. And Nadine is the first person in 150 years of our company, 150 years to be the first woman CEO at our company, 150 years. So when you think about breaking through, you know, and you think about having those people as mentors and idols, you know, you, you, you choose from people who have really, really blazed a pathway and trying to, to master your career along those kinds of same lines. And, and Nadine, you've certainly done that. You know, everyone uh, here uh, that's uh, been uh, in, in uh, both the uh, MBA uh, uh, group as well that we've been meeting tonight, as well as us on stage, have all faced risks and opportunities uh, when it comes to making decisions about our careers and our futures. So why don't we walk through a few of those, I call them forks in the road, because there's a path and then there are places to go and you can choose to go left or right sometimes. Um, and it's a pathway to the road to success. And sometimes it's a pathway to failure. But many times we learn more by failing and can apply that the next time we come to that next fork in the road. So we're gonna start with one of our favorite places here in uh, New Jersey. Uh, anybody from Tom's River? Hey, all right. Tom's River, New Jersey. Um, you were put in charge of a utility basically in the middle of a state investigation into childhood cancers that the community, many people in the community, believed were caused by either the air or the water supply or the soil. Or there was a whole investigation going on. Number one, did you feel comfortable taking that position? And then how did you go about building trust and confidence in a community that had probably lost its trust and its confidence in the water companies? capabilities of you know, providing service to their community. I should have known that you would have picked that example. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's, uh, it's an assignment uh, that uh, brought us very close together. Very close, yes, we, that's true. <laughs> we face uh, quite a bit of, um, hmm, let's put it this way, just challenges. Um, so comfortable, no, I don't think uh, that, uh, I was comfortable uh, and I don't think I have ever been comfortable when uh, taking uh, a new assignment because you always have uh, that uh, deep down uh, little fear of what if, you know, but I like to say uh, what if I succeed versus what if I fail. Um, so uh, I was not comfortable at all. And uh, because I did not, uh, that particular assignment was, uh, unexpected. So um, I didn't apply for, for that role. Uh, I was just asked uh, if I was uh, willing to take on that role. And um, without really having a clear picture of uh, the challenge that was at stake. So uh, my view of uh, that role was a very uh, high level. And I said, I can do it. Um, but um, as I got into the role, I realized that uh, it was uh, way more complex than uh, what I had anticipated. So uh, when, when you're in a situation like this, you have many choices. You can say, that's not for me. I am, I'm not going to do this. I didn't create this mess. I just go to the next thing. Uh, you can say that uh, I'm not willing to put uh, the, the efforts and uh, I will do an average job and move on. Or you can take on that challenge and say, okay, I need to really do my homework, understand the situation and resolve this. And not resolve it uh, for a short period of time, but put a solution that will be sustainable and that will last way beyond uh, the time that you, know, you are no longer in that role. So for me, uh, I, uh, I took it on and I said, uh, where am I gonna start? 
So what I learned during that assignment was the importance of uh, developing a plan, have uh, actions, of course, uh, monitor the actions of, and uh, ensuring uh, progress so you can really reach your goals. But one of the key aspects on developing that plan for me was to understand the community. So I remember the, the first week I was there, I asked a question. I said, do we have a stakeholder mapping? And it was blank, uh, I had no answer. So I asked the question again, um, and, uh, and I realized that we didn't have one or maybe the people didn't understand what I was asking. So um, it's a best practice that I kept with, him, with me, everything that, that I do is, before I start drawing my plan with my audience, what are the key issues? Who are these key stakeholders so I can meet them, understand their pain points, what worked and what didn't work, so I can develop uh, a plan that will work and that will be a continuous improvement plan while changing many other aspects of uh, the culture of uh, that particular organization that I was in charge with. The second thing that I learned while I was in that assignment was uh, you don't have a lot of time when you are in a crisis environment. So you need to be quick. You need uh, to be nimble. Uh, you need to surround yourself with competent people. And, uh, and you need uh, to clearly indicate to your behavior and actions that there is a new direction, there is a new leader, and uh, we're going to do things differently. So uh, it was a lot of things happening at the same time. So I also learned the importance of having your priorities clear, internal and communicated internally and externally, because we know we cannot do everything at the same time, right? So what are the things that are the most important, the most impactful? Let's make sure that they get done because you can have a plan that you will complete in three years, but some actions you need to take them in the first six months. So um, what I also learned uh, during that time is uh, that uh, often we uh, don't have the results and uh, the productivity that uh, uh, we want uh, from uh, our teams because we don't take the time to understand the talents that we have and putting the people not only at the right place at, uh, at, uh, you know, at the right time, but uh, with the right talent. So uh, uh, it was an experience uh, that helped me uh, grow as a leader. It was a tough experience um, that required many sacrifices. So it's something that you have to be very clear on when you take uh, um, role of uh, increased responsibilities. Uh, I miss uh, many events, uh, uh, many family events. Uh, I miss, uh, I remember one time I was uh, having people over for a barbecue at my place, my phone rang, I had to go back to Tom's River and it was a Saturday. But these are things that you do. Uh, and uh, once you accept to take on that assignment, you just embrace it and uh, go with it. The, the self-satisfaction satisfaction that you have once you see the positive impact that you have in the community, uh, the fact that your team rally around you, around you to, uh, to really go the, the next step uh, and have the recognition from the community, because for me, that was uh, the best reward uh, at the end was, uh, to turn around that, that project uh, so and it became a flagship for the whole organization on what best practices can be. And uh, this happened, uh, um, what, 15 years ago? Uh, and uh, 10 years, 15 years? 15 and years uh, so, and uh, the legacy uh, remains and uh, some of the best practices that were put in that time, you know, continue on. So, so for me, it was a success story, but 
I had to be out of my comfort zone. So I could have chosen to continue. Uh, I was a high performer. I would have continued to, to be in Huawei and be the operation manager in Huawei for a long period of time. I was very comfortable there. So when you are, uh, like Rich was saying, at the, a fork in the road, please do not always choose the path that is the most comfortable for you. Because by choosing uh, the, the, the path that you have less traveled, you, that will offer you greater opportunity to grow and discover more about yourself, your capability and your, your skills while expanding your knowledge. And when she talks about not being comfortable, can you imagine yourself in a community where the entire community has basically sued to take back the very franchise that, and that they actually never had it, but they sued to try to take the water utility that she was going to go down and run. So they were suing us and she's going to run the operation. The group that was heading um, the kids with cancer uh, group, um, wonderful woman, was very upset because we were not really engaged with her, the kids. And um, so she, she had two against her. And then the business community was sort of on our side, but not really on our side because they felt like we caused this whole thing. So it's almost as if she entered a community that didn't want her, all right? And you throw in the fact that Tom's River is not a very diverse community, and it's also uh, a very much a retirement community. So to get folks to change their mind and change their perception is a really, truly heroic deed to do. Um, the first meeting that greeted Nadine when she went down there was, and if you've ever been, everybody been to a mayor and council meeting? Oh, wow, you guys, have, you're not missing life if you haven't gone to a mayor and council meeting, okay? Well, it was almost like, and this is probably going to be in front of you too. Everybody remember the Watergate hearings? All right, you studied those. Beautiful. Well, her first meeting was like the Watergate hearing. It was an imposing council sitting 10 feet above you asking question after question after question for three hours, three hours. It was a grilling. In three years, three years time frame that Nadine spent from that day, from that grilling, where she probably went home and maybe cried that night, because <laughs> I would have, <laughs> because just thinking, and I had been down there for 10 years already, but this was beyond the pale. It was a very difficult meeting to, to go through. In three years, she was named person of the year in the entire community. For all the efforts, and she's exactly right. The efforts were her team, the people that she leads, the community, building that trust back with the community, talking to regulators, city officials, the entire community. You have to rebuild trust and credibility, and you only gain that through being transparent and honest and, and open and, and being able to, to communicate to your, to your teams. So after she left that, right, and in very good shape, and without a doubt, it's still in good shape. In fact, the, the woman, Linda Gillick, who, who heads the, the cancer group, calls Tom's River now the best water in the United States. That is how far that we have basically come in that short amount of time frame. Um, so after that, one of her next roles to take on well, it took her to the streets of Paris. So she goes to the streets of Tom's River, to the streets of Paris, <laughs> not directly to the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> so the, um, the job was to be the chief officer for health and safety. And we talk about forks in the road. In the year prior, our global organization had experienced 14 deaths of our own workers, all not just here in the United States, all across the globe. In fact, I don't think we had any. In None in the United States. <laughs> so 
now was her job to now communicate across the globe in all these other different countries. And uh, Suez at, it was in, oh boy, on five, well, in Europe, it's five continents. Here in the US, it's six continents. Um, so all across the globe would find her trying to improve our track record in health and safety. How do you follow that? How do you begin to even build that on a worldwide basis? You know, taking over a job with such responsibility, it's obviously no small task, is it? No small task indeed, Rich. But um, I think this was also uh, an opportunity of a lifetime for me. And um, the various roles that I had uh, previously had prepared me to take on this new challenge. But you have to be very clear about accepting a new role in terms of what that means for you and your family, if, if you have one, and understand that uh, although you may have a lot of knowledge, you have to ve be very humble uh, because you realize that there are a lot of things that you still don't know. I had a work uh, in various role, which in the US, so I had, a, I will say, a fairly good uh, national knowledge of how to run uh, the business. I could move from state to state. I had clients in about 35 states that I was dealing with. I uh, had clients uh, in Canada. But having an international uh, role is a whole different ballgame. And uh, for me, um, I uh, remember I was on, on the plane to Paris and I said, okay, what did I get myself into this time? Or am I going to do this? Because the role was not a role that uh, where I will be sitting comfortably uh, in, uh, in my office uh, in Paris with you on the Eiffel Tower, by the way. <laughs> um, but um, I had to deal with uh, a team that was scattered around the world. So uh, the significant uh, uh, difference was now, instead of having a national team, I had an international team that I didn't know. Um, and also my stakeholders were global stakeholders. So I have all the CEOs of the various region that I had to know to understand um, what was not working and what was working in their region. The external stakeholders, I have no idea who they were and uh, where to start. Um, and uh, I think uh, when you look at these factors, it's uh, a tremendous um, stress on yourself. So you have to be very clear that uh, in order for you to take on that, you will have the adequate support, your family support, but also your boss support. Uh, and uh, as I was getting <laughs> to know more about the role, the CEOs that I were dealing with, they were all men, uh, and uh, they have uh, already, uh, they were seasoned C CEOs. And I was coming in uh, to, to question them. But one of the, I would say, strength that I had was uh, to uh, be a good listener. It's important for you to, uh, when you're interacting uh, with uh, different cultures, to pay attention. First of all, to read about the culture before you go there so you know what to avoid saying or doing. But to really uh, show uh, the respect that you have for what they have accomplished in the past and what can be done better because you have to instill a continuous improvement mindset. And all you're going to go about it successfully is to first take the time to understand what's at stake. So um, the third element that was uh, challenging for me, I mean, uh, going to visit a country and living and working in, a in that country is a very different experience. Um, of course, we operate and work very differently in the US where we are uh, let's say they're very direct. Uh, 
we are uh, uh, working around the clock <laughs> and we expect that uh, people will do it when uh, things need to be done. But in each of the countries, uh, people work differently. In Paris, it was a 35 hour a week uh, type of uh, approach. Uh, and uh, don't call me uh, during the weekend. So uh, you have to understand all these elements in order for you to be effective at your job. So it was for me an, uh, an extraordinary um, a part of my journey where I learned a lot about myself, uh, about the business, and also the similarities that we have despite the differences uh, of our cultures, because we were all working towards a common goal. And the one reason why I was selected for that role is because I had a perfect score on health and safety in all the assignments that I had um, you know, during my, my career at the company. And, uh, and they, someone looked at it and said, there's something she must be doing right. <laughs> so maybe there are some best practices that could be shared you know, around the globe and um, that will impact positively the culture and therefore the results. So uh, I was there for about uh, three years and uh, we started uh, by having uh, uh, close to 20 uh, fatalities uh, of uh, employees or contractors working on site. Um, and um, when I left uh, uh, three years, uh, the first year um, after I, I started, uh, the numbers were diminished by half. And I say, oh, wow, okay, it's, it's good, but we should, every person that uh, is uh, severely injured or lose their life, it's one too many. So uh, we need to, to continue that improvement. But to go back to what I was telling you and sharing with you uh, with Tom's River, what's important is not putting a temporary band-aid or a temporary solution. It's all do we change the culture. So now there is a new way of doing business and put health and safety and security as an integral part of all the decision-making processes. So um, it was hard work. It was very tough at time because I had to review every single incident that uh, led to a fatality. Uh, so it was uh, some very, very difficult days, uh, but um, everything that I learned before helped me, you know, having a disciplined approach, a structural way of uh, conducting business, an effective way uh, to communicate and lead, and uh, really uh, engage everyone. So, I mean, we're talking about 90,000 employees um, around a common goal, which was safety always. Always have safety in your mind and watch yourself, but watch also each other. And um, so when I came back to the US, uh, I continued to follow because I had prepared uh, the one person that I had identified as my potential successor. And that's another aspect that you always have to keep in mind. When you work for an organization, in order for you to go to the next level, you better share your knowledge and prepare someone else to succeed you. Because you can be very good at what you do. If there is no one to really take on that responsibility, they will ask you to stay a little bit longer in that role, even if you may not want it. So that's an important part of uh, what you will be doing uh, uh, in the future. So I was delighted to see that uh, the person I recommended uh, uh, took on the job and uh, the improvement continued uh, to the point that uh, we reached zero uh, fatality last year. So you, you really have uh, to, to look at uh, the big picture, put your priorities, don't get discouraged because you will have setbacks because every time it was a phone call that told me something happened in Australia, something happened in China, something happened in the Middle East or wherever that was happening, uh, it was always, it could have been avoided. And those were very difficult moments, but also very, um, a, a lot of opportunities to learn 
and do things better moving forward. So, but I didn't know, what I didn't know uh, during that, uh, while I was working in Paris, I didn't know what was gonna be next for me because I had made it clear that I didn't want to stay in Paris uh, for a long time, uh, uh, I'd say three to four years. And I had accepted that role because it was at the right time in my personal life. My son was in college, I only have one, one child. My husband was uh, semi-retired <laughs> and uh, so he could travel with me. But if they had asked me uh, to take on that role five years prior, I would have to say no. So you have to know when it's the right time for you and do not overcommit uh, because uh, you will not be successful if you have a lot of other factors that prevent you to reach your full potential. So we, we only have about uh, two or three minutes left and then we're gonna open up to the audience. If, if you look at, and, and we know what the next step was, was when you became CEO. Um, and I certainly know that everybody in this room, because we're still dealing with it, had to deal with COVID-19, but you stepped in, became CEO and COVID-19 was on your doorstep in about uh, four months. Um, what did you and your team prioritize for this? And, and you know, how did you get through that? And unfortunately, we've only One got a minute. couple of minutes to, yes. to run through it. <laughs> One minute to talk about the pandemic. What, but nobody yeah. wants to talk about COVID anymore anyway. So, uh, no, but uh, this is uh, really uh, the ability to uh, handle the unexpected because you will have that happen to you in your life several times. So you can anticipate, you can be prepared for the unexpected, but it's always something that will happen that you could not have thought of. We had playbook for many crises, we didn't have a playbook for the pandemic. So we had to react very quickly, put in place new priorities. So people pivot completely our way of conducting business to ensure the health and safety of our employees, the health and safety of the community that we serve, to ensure that water was provided 24 seven, and to ensure that business sustainability, that we will navigate through that crisis and come out even stronger as an organization. And that's what we have been able to achieve successfully. And you, you think about that, and you, you, you know, there were so many, and you know that as well, there's so many unknowns with COVID, there still are. But you know, in our case, we had people who were working in close facilities, running water plants, distributing water out to millions of people, or, or taking care of wastewater services. And that service could not be stopped. It's not like you could just go run it from home. You had to show up, you had to be in that office. And then we had to come up with policies and procedures that ensured that they were safe. Yes, and uh, communicate, communicate, communicate. When you're in crisis, it's extremely important. I was doing uh, videos uh, with, uh, and my son was uh, taping uh, the videos the first uh, few weeks in March because we were not going to the office and uh, sending them through, coordinating with Rich to have, uh, uh, this communication uh, to all the employees uh, to keep them informed on uh, what to do, what to avoid doing, or are we doing as a company, and uh, tracking uh, uh, the progress and ensuring that everybody was uh, kept uh, safe. And I'm very pleased to say that zero employee was uh, really uh, contaminated at the workplace. So we were able to put the barriers and control that work uh, during a very uncertain time. And for me, the best part was that Nadine's husband and son became a production team, right? <laughs> they learned how to use the camera, work with audio. They did everything we needed them to do to film her at home, to shoot those videos every week. So it was wonderful. And they're still waiting for their paycheck, believe me. <laughs> I guess uh, if we'd like to, Susan, uh, open it up to, uh, to, to this absolutely fantastic audience. I, I applaud all of you. You did, guys are just fantastic. This was a wonderful, you guys work so well together as a team. Um, we do have a small gift for each of you that I'm gonna be giving to you. Um, as you can see, there are some of our undergraduate students who are politely exiting the room, but we are going to continue with some Q&A. There'll be some microphones that we're gonna be walking around with. So please stay put um, for our MBA students and um, we'll be able to have like a little bit more intimate of a conversation here. So. Again, thank you. Excellent. Thank you.
half of the production company. Yeah. <laughs> if you do have a question, please go ahead and just raise your hands. And again, we'll come around with a microphone and right they say the stress level actually increases right and with a lot of distractions with family and with social life and health life spiritual life and all other all the other actually aspects of life so how can how could you actually and how what what are your strategies of getting into that level so for me uh one word preparation so um whatever you do short meeting, long meetings, um, meeting, uh, uh, doing an interview or whatever it is, take the time to prepare yourself. Even when you are at the very high level, in order for you to perform consistently at a high level, you must take the time to prepare yourself. And uh, trust your instinct, but also, have a disciplined approach. That was what I was saying before. You have to take time for yourself. So at some point you have to put that cell phone away uh, for a few minutes. You have uh, to do, uh, uh, to go for a walk, go uh, for a massage session, go do things that allow you to decompress and to rest. Uh, because uh, the higher you go, the more demanding uh, the, the job is but you are responsible to manage your time and create that balance. You will have period of time that will be uh, at a very, very tense uh, level. Once you're done and the, the, that issue or crisis is resolved, then take the time to decompress. Um, so, uh, so it's important for you to know yourself, to know your body, what uh, how far you can go, and then take those time. So for me, uh, what, what at work um, uh, is uh, I will, for instance, uh, instead of going uh, at seven o'clock in, <laughs> in the office after I had a couple of weeks uh, of uh, long hours, uh, then I will work from home. Uh, so that will allow, allow me to sleep a little bit longer. You know, I will take a day off here and there. So you, you just have to tweak uh, your, your, your schedule, but, when you do uh, a job that you enjoy, um, that's, uh, I will say, uh, the factor that will make you maintain uh, that balance uh, very well because your stress level will be managed better. Uh, the experience that you acquired allow you to be more confident uh, about what you do. And, uh, and then listen to uh, the people that care about you because uh, they will see the sign at home <laughs> when you're very tired to tell you, okay, now, now it's time. But uh, it can be done. Yeah, I may have like some misconception about it. Like, for example, uh, as Sherry just got out of my head now, uh, somebody else can just ask. If it, if it comes back, I would ask it. Sorry. Okay, no, no problem. <laughs> when we back here. Hi, um, Ms. Cynthia, do you have any, like, that time when you were in a, com like, a situation with uh, different people from around the world to talk to, do you have any language barrier with them when you're trying to express something to them about the situation, how to solve the situation, and things like that? That's a, that's a great question. Yes. <laughs> a great question. So, um, well, we are very fortunate because... Uh, Many people around the world speak English. <laughs> so being an international company, uh, although I work in Paris, English was uh, the business language. And, uh, but when I visited uh, the different countries, at times things were lost in translation. So I always had uh, with me uh, someone that was local, uh, that spoke both English and the local language uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, the exchange that I was having was effective. 
Um, but uh, what I have found out uh, with uh, Suez was uh, that uh, regardless of what part of the world that you work uh, with, and for me, that was one of the strengths of the company. Once uh, you carry that logo, uh, you were part of the family. So uh, I will be in conferences and see people, oh, they have a Suez hat, let me go and talk to them to see if they are from the company or not. And uh, so that uh, team spirit and winning spirit that was instilled within uh, the company was our strength. So I didn't experience uh, really, uh, I will say, uh, uh, the challenge of uh, not being understood. But what I was saying before, one of the things that I have done every time that I was traveling was to always take the time to read about the culture of that country. So um, I can uh, really be more effective at what I was doing. But thank you for the question. Um, hi, hello. Uh, from the country where I come from, uh, we call it um, elbows. So people will try to use the elbows so, uh, as an obstacle uh, to reach the highest level. In your experience, how bad were these elbows or were there any case and what did you do? <laughs> I had many of those. <laughs> and uh, they were men most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, I think uh, that uh, what you have to do is always focus on uh, improving your knowledge and uh, learn to be in your full potential and not be afraid to be visible. When I say that is you have to be not only present, but visible. So when you're in a meeting, you have to ensure that you speak up, <laughs> that uh, you speak your views, that you don't let self, yourself be intimidated by others because you think they are more experienced or, or, or whatever. Um, but be prepared. So that means that uh, one thing that we cannot fake is knowledge. Right? And it's the worst thing that you can do is trying to project what, uh, what you're not uh, because it will catch up with you quite quickly. Um, I always uh, say that people can fool us uh, during an interview, but uh, you put them uh, uh, in front of a problem to be resolved and you will know quickly if they know that uh, subject or not. So um, stand up for yourself, uh, be always uh, prepared and seize the opportunity. I often tell um, uh, my uh, team or my, some of the mentees that I have, it's important for you to know your, your boss's job and be ready to step up because that boss will be sick, will be not available, uh, and uh, you may have uh, to represent uh, him or her at any given time. So don't take the back seat, take the front seat. Um, and uh, when they push the elbows, guess what? Consider that being a push forward. Uh, and um, so, and move on uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, you, uh, to your next uh, level. And don't let that distract you. Because I think um, uh, for us uh, women uh, in particular, I was looking at some statistics in the Fortune 500 uh, companies and I saw that it's about 41, 45 women that are CEOs. So you can see that we have a long way to go. It's less than 10%. But when we look at uh, the US in, in general, uh, women in leadership position, we had made some good progress because we are more uh, in the 30% range now. So which is promising that we will have a lot more women CEOs in, in the next decade. So um, be confident be yourself uh, and be assertive at time and have a voice. So that would be uh, my recommendation. Uh, hello, um, 
earlier it was mentioned about how important communication was in any business situation or any crisis situation um from my own experience with communication especially from a leadership perspective one of the most important things a leader should be able to do is understand the strengths and weaknesses of each of the individuals that are working with or under them i was wondering if maybe in your own experience, you may have discovered or developed a few tricks on how to, as quickly as possible, understand the strengths and weaknesses of the people working with you so you could delegate appropriately. Very good question. Um, so um, if you recall, I mentioned earlier, we don't have time to do everything, right? So, and I'm, uh, I'm certainly not an expert in HR, so for some tasks, you call the experts, right? So uh, what I have done uh, uh, while I was in the process of putting uh, my uh, executive team uh, together, I'd ask uh, an expert, uh, human resources firm, to conduct an assessment of each member of my team because it was important for me to know their strength and the areas of improvement. I don't like to the word their weaknesses too much. Um, but um, in order to place them where they could really produce uh, uh, at the level that I was anticipating while having a plan to help them improve those areas while optimizing their strength. So uh, I think it's a very important aspect of whenever you have a team to make sure that you know their strength and area of improvements because that's how you build high-performing teams. So, uh, but I, was, I will caution you of uh, not trying to do it yourself because first of all, as a boss, it's difficult for you to sit down with the person and say, tell me about your strengths and weaknesses. And, uh, and it's not really our, our, our expertise, but I had found it very valuable to have you know, these different uh, reports that highlighted uh, uh, you know, the profile of uh, each uh, member of my team. And a lot of things, you know, I knew and some I didn't. Hi, uh, this is more of a question about your organization. Um, I was curious if you're suffering from staffing shortages and how you're addressing that. Uh, the answer is yes, um, and you probably have a good feel that there is a, a battle out there for talent. Uh, we've seen, if you will, uh, quite a few resignations, I mean, in a lot of different um, professions. Uh, Nadine and I sit on the board of a hospital, and, and you know, there are just nursing shortages that have, that have occurred all throughout that industry. And there's a changing, if you will, the paradigm of, of, of how nursing is, is, is applying itself these days. In our organization, we have a shortage, if you will, of um, operators, people who actually have the uh, licensing and the capabilities of running water or wastewater treatment, especially what we would call class four, which is the highest level of, of treatment. Uh, those licenses are, are, are gold. And we've actually got right now um, and recently just put it in a school uh, within our own school uh, that actually takes uh, our own, not just our own folks, but some of the other folks that want to get involved in a community and get their license as, as a job skill. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing. But Yes, there's a shortage of professionals as well in the marketplace as well. I would tell you right now, I believe we have probably about 600 openings for positions, uh, not just here in New Jersey, but throughout the country. Yes, but I think uh, that uh, the impact of the pandemic obviously uh, is uh, very clear and visible. As organization, if we do not uh, change uh, our way of, of working, and uh, allow more flexibility and a hybrid uh, way of, of working, then we will lose our talents because this type of flexibility is offered elsewhere. 
So uh, it's a situation uh, that uh, we hope uh, will somewhat stabilize uh, over the next uh, two years. But one thing that uh, it's clear to me that uh, has changed uh, completely is uh, uh, the fact that uh, today we can work remotely when four years ago, that's not something that was contemplated by many organizations. What my concern is uh, that uh, we will have a shortage of essential workers. Uh, and that's something that uh, we have uh, to work on. Some tasks or some jobs are no longer attractive uh, for, uh, for the young um, people uh, uh, like you. And uh, so that's a, a problem that um, uh, we are facing that we have to find a way to make these jobs uh, more attractive. Um, so uh, in the next 10 years, that will be the focus on, um, uh, on the utilities and some other areas for essential workers. Yes. You remember now. <laughs> So as a student, as an MBA student or business analytics student, I would love to hear like not from the first position, which is like great achievement, right? But from our station as a student, right? What's the step that we should take? Because actually, you know, maybe I'm, I was exposed when I finished my bachelor in business administration that going to MBA or taking business administration is so broad. So you have to be specialized somehow in strategic management, HR management, whatever management, to be able to get to the CEO basically, or to get to the soft skills or the hard skills. This is the, this is the other question if I can ask, which is which is better to have the hard skills or soft skills more to get to that position of basically giving a lot of decisions with precision. Thank you. We'll start uh, by the second part. You need both. <laughs> you need to have hard and soft skills. Um, what uh, but the soft skills uh, are essential when you're in a management position and so uh if you are going to be a researcher a loaner in uh you know just uh, master the hard skills that may be sufficient but once you interact with people uh and uh have uh, some type of supervisor supervisory or management uh, uh role then uh, you definitely need uh, to have uh, soft skills so uh what to do and uh, where to go. One of the things that uh, you all have uh, to realize is you are all very fortunate because you have a higher education. And uh, by making that decision, you have positioned yourself to a vast uh, number of opportunities. You will be at uh, the fork in the road that Rich was mentioning. And it's a good place to be because you have options. But once you make a decision, you will have to also have uh, the courage to explore, as I said before, uh, the road less traveled, you know, go outside of your comfort zone. But what's important is to realize what works for you and what doesn't. I often say to uh, my, uh, uh, my uh, friends' kids that I uh, sometimes uh, sponsor for different uh, activities, you have to know where to stick with uh, your, your goals, uh, to stick with the company, but you also have to know where to walk away. So uh, if you work for an organization that doesn't recognize your talent or is not a right culture fit for you, walk away, start to look for something else because you will never have the opportunity to grow and you will know. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a decision that no one can really take for you. Uh, you have uh, to trust that you have acquired the knowledge that will allow you to flourish. And uh, one of the things that I will recommend uh, to you all, if you don't have one yet, is really to have a mentor. Because for me, that's what really made a big difference when I was in some of these decision-making um, uh, uh, roles and uh, decision-making uh, uh, point 
in my career, then you need to bounce sometimes uh, your, your ideas with someone that has your back. You're welcome. I think we have time for one last question. Hello, uh, thank, you for, thank you for being here. Um, my question is when you're managing teams and whether that's outsourcing or whether that's within your company um, and you have multiple deadlines, how do you manage to create a balance between giving them like enough support, um, but also like um, disciplining them enough so that they can deliver within time. And there are certain tasks which require innovation and um, thinking outside the box and which is understandable that it might not be easy, but still you have to meet those deadlines. So like, how do you, like any advice on that? Well, <laughs> um, when you're the boss, you have to know a lot of things and you have to know the workload of your team. And uh, you also have uh, to decide what are the other of the priorities. So uh, one of the things that you have to avoid is uh, to overwhelm your team and uh, to do that on a consistent basis because uh, you will burn out. Um, so first, once you have some tight deadline, deadlines is to understand how many of those do I have? Am I putting this on the same team, on the same people all the time? And uh, or do I shuffle the cards and then now move the priorities? So uh, I think that's uh, the job of uh, any boss uh, to do. And as you're measuring uh, the progress, understand if there are needs for additional support to accelerate and ensure that it's delivered timely with the quality uh, that uh, you expect. So you need to really, uh, based on the maturity of your team, you need to be very present or not as present, but have a milestone where you have uh, an assessment of how the project is going in order to make any adjustments necessary. I hope that uh, that answers your question. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much uh, for your questions and your attention. It was really a, an amazing um, evening uh, and a great opportunity for me to interact with you. And I hope uh, that uh, the exchange that we had was helpful. But remember, it is your time. The world needs you. It's your time to shine. It's your time to lead. And uh, also, remember about giving back. I expect to see you here in a few years <laughs> to share your own journey. Uh, with uh, the future generations of uh, MSU students. Well done, John.